My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today the Church celebrates the first scrutiny of the catechumens who are preparing themselves for baptism at the Easter Vigil. I can imagine there must be thousands all over the world. Maybe you know some of them in your parish or among your friends. And so we pray for them now as they prepare themselves and ask the Lord to increase their desires to be purified by the waters of baptism. And then after that, confirmation and then Holy Eucharist. Even the coronavirus can't take away that joy of being with Christ and being purified with him. Well, Sunday's Gospel about the Samaritan woman in St. John is really, I mean, it's rich with meaning. It's as though every phrase opens a new horizon for us to discover. And it's worthwhile reading it over slowly now in the presence of God, knowing that, Lord, well, you want to tell me something here. Perhaps a word will jump out uh, or an image that I hadn't noticed before. After all, this is your divine word, Lord, your word. So I want to hear that word and understand what you're suggesting to me. Your words to me can leap out of the page, touch me as, well, they're inspired. They're inspired, the, the inspired word of God, and therefore they're still alive. They're inspired. They're alive now, right now. Imagine your Bible right now is jittery on the shelf or on the nightstand or wherever you keep it in the glove compartment in the car. And it's telling you, open me, open me. I'm here waiting for you. Go to chapter 4 of chapter John, of, of, of uh, chapter 4 of St. John. Okay? And of course there, well, the first thing we read is that Jesus comes to this Samaritan town called Sikar. Not a friendly place for Jews, but he goes there nevertheless. And he goes directly to this well at the heat of the day, in, in the heat of the day at noon. And there are many wells in, Bible, in the Bible. Isaac met uh, Rebecca at a well. Of course, this is the, the, the well where Jacob met Rachel, and then it took him seven years before he could marry her. And then another seven years he had to work for her to be able to marry her. And uh, he first set his eyes on her at this well. And uh, she was going there to water, get water for the animals. And even Moses, too, he met his wife, Zephra, at, at a well. Today, the modern version of the well, I guess, is the water cooler at the office, right? There's always lots of rich conversations that take place there. But here, our Lord is at the well. He's tired, exhausted, and suddenly comes this Samaritan woman at a rather unusual hour. And there, a dialogue ensues that at first keeps her a bit distant, but progressively gets her closer and closer to him. You may go to church, and you may know about Jesus and the Bible, but it's not very attractive when you're kind of distant and cool and sort of apprehensive. Okay? But let's remember that our Lord is always there. Jesus is always close by. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't condemn her. He doesn't judge us. Okay? Let him really, truly come close to you during this time of Lent. And indeed, uh, why, why have you clicked on this podcast? Maybe it's uh, to come to the well and be in conversation with you, Lord. That's why you've clicked on this podcast. So, so even if it's a bad time, even if you're really busy, there's always you know, plenty of stress and things to do. You know, he's always there. He's interested, very interested in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing now. We're having a conversation with you, Lord. It reminds me of a story of a religious sister who took her vows in the early 60s. And everything, well, shortly after she took her vows, she was excited and stuff, but shortly after, everything started going crazy. It was the post-conciliar time. There was lots of confusion. Things were changing. People were leaving the, her order. Priests, you know, left and stuff. And, she, well, it was very confusing. She she began to doubt about her faith. She started to read lots of stuff, not, not all very good stuff. And eventually, she kind of got a kind of a depression and and she was kind of glum for a while. And then one day, as she's looking out the window, kind of musing, looking out with a kind of a melancholic gaze, 
she thought to herself, God, if if you exist, please, like, do something about this. And, well, she turned to go back into the room, but suddenly she, she said, oh, bumped into something invisible as if, as though she were bumping into a man's chest that was invisible and suddenly she heard the very clear words don't you know i've been with you all this time and she said out loud no no i didn't but now suddenly with that experience it was like a mystical experience now she suddenly had this certainty that he was there in fact that he had been accompanying her through this entire trial was that not the Holy Spirit, she thought? And this, this encounter facilitated a conversation with Jesus, and she knew that the Holy Spirit was always there and invisibly pre present, but absolutely present. Right? And, uh, and this was like a, like a current of energy that connected her with Jesus. And she started writing books about the Holy Spirit, books about Jesus. Right? And I would say that the Samaritan woman also in the same way kind of like bumped into Jesus, right? But through a conversation with him there at this well, her habitual place of work and her habitual place maybe of rest. Now, a dominant theme, of course, in this passage is the, the theme, of course, of water, water at the well, and also of thirst, the thirst that we all experience when we are deprived of water. We all need water, and without it, we, it's obviously we can't survive. But it's not just water that we're deprived of. Think of Jesus on the cross. He's thirsting on the cross. He's deprived of water. But when they reached up uh, a sponge on a, on a reed of hyssop, they reached up a sponge so he could drink. They offered it to him, but he would not drink. He was kind of expressing that he had actually a deeper thirst that welled up from his sacred heart. Uh, and... He, that's why he didn't actually drink. He said, this won't satisfy me. I have a deeper desire. This is what Pope Benedict said about that. He said, God thirsts for our faith and our love. Like a good and merciful father, he desires for us all, all possible good, and this good is God himself. And for her part, the Samaritan woman represents the existential unhappiness of those who have not found what they are looking for. She had five husbands and is now living with a man. Her coming and going to the well represents a repetitive and resigned life, he says. So we can picture Jesus tired and sitting there at the well, and he reaches out to her with his desire that she be with God, right? And there are many paintings of this scene from ancient Christian mosaics to Gothic manuscripts to Renaissance pieces and, and Baroque, dynamic Baroque paintings. You know? But always the Lord is seated, his hand in a gesture, a kind of a, a petition, reaching out to her. Yeah? Also at the same time looking a bit like a, like a teacher. And there she is glued. She is transfixed. And the Lord says to the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What a marvelous conversation we could have with you, Lord, if we really understood who you are reaching out to us. Imagine he opened up horizons full of adventure to her, the adventure of being with God in the grace of God. She had been looking in the wrong places for solace. Now he promises her something that she just like never imagined. And it led to her conversation with him, but then to a conversion. And immediately she wants to go off to the village to tell others about what she has experienced. And she wants to leave her jugs behind. And they suddenly seem so, so secondary to her. It seems so essential to tell others about him. Perhaps they too will have that conversion. She doesn't want to keep him just for herself. And then Jesus gets more specific. He says, the water I shall give you will become, uh, no, the water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Welling up to eternal life. And meaning that a water that is not just good for life here. That's not just what I'm giving. 
just for human refreshment, human flourishing, but leaping over into something supernatural, something eternal. And indeed, eternal life and heaven seem like awkward words to many today. They picture heaven as an endless continuity of the same thing as though they were playing the harp on, on, on a cloud or something. You know? so, so eternal life seems too long. It almost seems boring to people. And that's why it's perhaps dropped out of the vocabulary of many people. And people think that, well, it's better to be concerned about poverty and, and problems here below and fixing the coronavirus and stuff. And yeah, that's good to do. But what is the result if we forget about eternity? Well, life, human suffering, everything becomes immensely more absurd. And we throw up our hands at, at everything and everything seems immensely off kilter. If the balance of eternity is missing, all suffering, all sacrifice just seems like absurd, disproportionate, unbalances us, and it even crushes us. So we ask now our Lord for that supernatural logic that will change us so that we can sit at the well of the presence of God and an awareness of our divine filiation. Our Lady will help us. She will she will offer that, us that water too. And we can get that living water in the mercy of confession, in the grace of the sacraments, or just in a simple vocal prayer. I ask you for this grace, Lord. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.